will join in progress. Um, good morning and welcome. My name is Adam Block. I'm the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. This open meeting of the Needham Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely consistent with current state regulations and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. We don't anticipate this particular meeting will have public comment. First, we'll confirm that all members of the select board, uh, rather of the Council of Economic Advisors are present. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. For those participating in the meeting, uh, for others participating in this meeting, uh, please also be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you share or state will be a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website at needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. And before I call the roll, just a final note about our meeting ground rules. The ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I will introduce any speakers on our agenda. After they conclude the remarks, each member will have an opportunity um, to speak. We ask that you please, before you speak, say your name so uh, we can record it properly uh, in the, our minutes. And now for our uh, roll call. Um, again, if you're present, please respond in the affirmative. And if you're not present, I guess you can't say much. Uh, Stuart Angler. Agler, here. Thank you, Stu. Uh, Tina. Glenn. Here. Bill. Here. Virginia. Here. Mo. Here. Adam. Here. David. Here. Rick. Mike Wilcox. Here. Very good. We can't see you, but we suddenly hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm commuting right now, so. Well, that's allowed. We don't want to distract you. Thank you. <laughs> Keep my eyes on the road. Eyes on the prize. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Henschel. Here. Very good. Uh, Anne-Marie Dowd. Matt Telkoff. So uh, a, couple, uh, uh, a couple of notes um, on the council, and then I'm going to um, You need to add least. Well, I, I was just about to make this announcement that uh, Ted Owens, you stole my thunder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Ted, Mo. <laughs> Ted Owens uh, has resigned from the board, uh, from, the, from our council. And uh, we're delighted that, uh, uh, that the town has appointed Lise Elcock to our uh, council. Lise uh, is a current resident of Needham. Am I correct in that? 30 years, yes. And Current also, uh, and also uh, is um, uh, on the uh, Needham Newton Chamber. And are you running the, the Needham group? The, the, the group, oh, the Needham Business Alliance? Yes, or is that still Paul? Uh, so no, that's a committee under the chamber. And actually Paula Jacobson is the chair and I'm just a liaison with the chamber to facilitate that committee. Excellent. But that's a chamber committee. And Paul Good is on it, but uh, Paula is the, uh, is the current chair. Excellent. Well, we are delighted that you're here. Uh, you know, the, Thank you. Uh, we've been dealing so much with, you know, with the chamber and your support of a number of these programs and your insights has been uh, very helpful for local business. And it's a great addition to our council. Welcome. Thank you, Adam. Really happy uh, to be here. I uh, I also note for the record, Anne Marie is present, uh, and Tina, you are present. If you could both respond, aye, that would be helpful for the record. Here, aye. Excellent, Adam. I don't I don't know if you got me, but I'm having some computer problems, and I was going in and out when you were calling roll, so I didn't respond. 
So that's Rick. Uh, yes. Rick. We record you as present. Thank you very much. We can hear you now fine. We can't see you, but we won't. I, I don't know why, but <laughs> it's probably for the better. <laughs> so we won't hold that against you. I, um, Can you see me, Adam? Who's me? Amory. I see you frozen. Okay. But I hear you. I hear you most importantly. I <laughs> I I also see that we have um, uh, from town staff. We have uh, Tim McDonald from the Department of Health, and. I believe we have Lee Newman, although again, we don't have video. And Lee, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. Uh, I see David with uh, his hand up. David. Yes, um, Adam, I just, before we got beyond the um, recognition of, of Lee uh, joining us and, and Ted um, no longer with us, I just thought I would um, ask if we can sort of assume that you as uh, both our chair and a member of the planning board will continue to kind of act as a liaison between us and and that body, in at least unofficially. Yes. That was it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for the thank you for the question. Uh, and so uh, uh, again, welcome to our newest member, Lee's. Um, glad everyone was able to make it uh, this morning. I. Uh, we, uh, we now turn to um, the minutes from October 14. Uh, every, we've had these minutes. There have been a couple of comments that I understand Amy has, uh, oh, I apologize. Amy, I didn't recognize you as our staff person. <laughs> our okay, right. Good morning. Economic Development Manager, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Um, so I understand that you have, uh, made some revisions uh, to the minutes, uh, is that correct? That's, that's correct, that's so, correct. Uh, we can regard those uh, changes as housekeeping. Uh, does anybody else have any other comments on the changes? So barring none subject to some of to these um, housekeeping changes to the minutes, um, if I have a motion to approve the minutes, uh, including the housekeeping changes. So moved. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Bill Day, on the second. And uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. And as I call the vote, I will uh, read out um, your name, and if you can respond in the affirmative or negative, that will be helpful. Uh, Stu. Proof. Tina. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Bill. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Mo. Yes. Adam Meisner. Yes. David Montgomery. Yes. Rick. Yes. Mike. Yes. Anne Marie. Yes. And is, uh, uh, Bob, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. And I, uh, Adam Block, as chair, I as well. Um, the motion Mama, yes. carries. The minutes are approved. Uh, I'd like to now turn uh, for an update on what's happening with COVID here. Uh, there's been some changes afoot, obviously, that most of us, I think, are aware of. Tim, can you please lead us through the changes, where we're at and where you see us going? Sure, I'm happy to. I think, uh, as most folks know, there's been a significant uptick nationally in the number of daily cases. Uh, we broke 80,000 um, and then pushed past that. Uh, in the state, uh, there was eight consecutive days of over 1,000 cases a day, and yesterday, excuse me, was just below, but I imagine when a couple days worth of tests come in, it'll go back over a thousand. So those are concerning numbers. Uh, in Needham, we are, uh, we were in the green last week when more than a third of the Commonwealth was in the red. And that's a pretty neat trick because there's a lot of parts of the Commonwealth where it's very hard to actually be in the red given the population density uh, or lack thereof. Um, 
Needham is going to have its highest uh, number of cases uh, in a two-week average that's in the, for the data that's going to be reported this week. Um, it will be near the top of the yellow range. Uh, if people remember when uh, schools reopened or were, were planning to reopen in mid-August, the Commonwealth rolled out a sort of green, yellow, red, uh, based on your average daily cases per 100,000 population. Um, so Needham has been in the green, except for a, a brief period in the yellow, and now we'll be right on the border between the, the yellow and the red. Um, we have some data on both statewide and in Needham, what sort of clusters look like. And, and as more and more sort of is understood about the COVID-19 um, virus, we're understanding more about how it's spread. Uh, and <laughs> public health experts are getting much more concerned about clusters um, where you know one person spreads it to a number of people who spread it to a number of people. Um, it's not the exact same thing as a super spreader event, but a super spreader event by definition is a cluster, a very big cluster. Um, both statewide and in Needham, the super majority of cases are related to family or social interactions. Um, in Needham, we've seen that play out. We have seen a number of cases related to youth sports uh, and that's a cause for concern. <clears throat> Olin College has had zero cases among its student body, which is fantastic. And the Needham Public Schools have seen zero cases of sustained transmission. So there's been a school-age person or two who's gotten COVID, but from our best uh, understanding and our best efforts with contact tracing, it's because they were playing on a hockey team and two of their other teammates got sick, not, not because they got sick from going to fifth grade or something. Um, so that's a very positive thing. I do think the fact that Needham has gone up is a concern and certainly um, you know, I'll just be direct. Like if we knew that restaurants were causing, um, you know, all the infections, it would be very easy from a public health and governmental sense to say, okay, stop restaurants. It's much more challenging to say, okay, we really need to hammer home to people because we've been trying for a while. You need to be responsible. Your kids shouldn't be having play dates. You shouldn't be having the neighbors over for dinner unless they're part of your immediate family bubble. Um, so it, from our perspective as public health, it makes it much more challenging, but we want to follow the data. And right now our, our data is showing that the source of infections in Needham is related to youth sports. It's related to play dates. It's related to kids hanging out and it's related to their parents, not necessarily modeling good behavior. Um, the governor as I think people maybe uh, heard on, um, I'm losing my dates now, but I think it was Monday. Um, uh, announced three revised or reissued executive orders. Um, one of them applies to face coverings uh, and it so it expands it beyond face coverings in um, the previous order applied basically when you could not maintain six feet of distance. And now it basically says you have to wear face coverings unless you're sort of in your private property on your, on your front yard, in your house, in your car. But if you're walking on the sidewalk in the downtown, you need to have your face covering on regardless of whether anyone's around. Um, our ability to enforce that um, is in question. I think um, I think maybe Mo and Amy have heard this at least once already, but um, my ability to chase down a jogger and give them a ticket is probably limited. They're gonna be able to outrun me. Um, so I think we're really counting on public messaging and hopefully people really um, listening to sort of guidance and trying to do their best to model behavior. The orders do affect um, businesses, and I think people probably have heard the GLOBE coverage of it. Um, in large part, there's a strong recommendation um, for people to essentially be in by 10 p.m., uh, between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Um, there is a requirement that a number of businesses, including um, restaurants serving alcohol or restaurants with in-person dining, will stop those operations, although not necessarily their takeout operations, by 9.30 at night. Um, businesses like uh, grocery stores, gas stations, things that might sort of fit into the more common definition of essential, don't have to follow that 9.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. sort of uh, uh, demarcation line. Uh, but it is an effort essentially just sort of cut down on the amount of social interaction. Um, I would want to sort of emphasize one of the things we're seeing that is a cause for concern. Um, is that a number of people are having the same level of social interaction as they did pre-COVID. Um, so that, and I apologize if people have heard this before, we had um, a parent, uh, parents and, and a child who were very diligent, but the child played on um, 
you know, two hockey teams, one of which was a travel team, one of which was a Needham specific team, a soccer team and a lacrosse team. And the exposure, you know, the, the number of contacts from that case was significant. Uh, one of the reasons that Massachusetts did a pretty good job of getting the COVID-19 pandemic under control is with the lockdown, there wasn't much opportunity to bump into other people or hang out with other people and pass along COVID. Um, so we're really trying to emphasize to people that our public health control measures are not about doing everything you normally do just with a mask and a few feet back than you know you normally would be. It's really about prioritizing. That doesn't mean you can't do some activities that you want to do. It's just each activity you do, no matter how well managed, adds a little bit of risk. Um, I've been using sort of the Christmas tree analogy. If you keep hanging ornaments on the Christmas tree, it eventually tips over. So people have to sort of think and prioritize about what are the really important things that I need to do, that my family needs to do, that my kids need to do, and what are the things that we can say, I would normally do this, but I'm going to refrain from this, or I'm going to limit this, or I'm going to do it in a slightly different way than I would because there is uh, the risk of infection to my family, and then our risk to potentially spread it to other people. Tim, uh, what's your access? There's been some question about access to contact tracing data to help uh, target uh, more specific um, actions. Have you, what's your access like to the state level data and to local data on contact tracing? You must have Sure. So I, I think people have probably heard Governor Baker talk about the Community Tracing Collaborative. Um, it's an initiative the state uh, ramped up. They are doing a lot better than they were in the spring. Um, we still feel that they don't necessarily provide us the level of service we're looking for. Um, in part, that's a, you know, we have a more local number. People might listen. We also have better connections. So we try to do the majority of our contact tracing internally. Uh, we've added a number of per diem staff that we're training in contact tracing. We've added um, we've added another full-time public health nurse whose almost entire focus is on contact tracing. Um, that doesn't mean we don't occasionally have to rely on the CTC if there is a big cluster at once, but we've tried to do it in-house. What that means is people are contacted more quickly and we get in touch with more, uh, we get in touch with 100% of the actual cases and the CTC generally hits 90%. And we get in touch generally with 95 to 99% of the contacts within a 24 hour period where the CTC is looking at about 80 to 85% within a 48 hour period. Um, and that can, that can make a big difference. Um, I will say that contact tracing to then sort of backtrace to try to track an infection all the way back is so incredibly time consuming that in Needham and in the state, we've only managed to do that on about 50% of the cases. So we don't know where about 50% of the cases come from. Um, I think, you know, if you look at other countries that have successfully done contact tracing, Korea is probably the best example, South Korea. Um, they were able to get the number of cases down so low that it was a lot easier to do contact tracing. Even when Massachusetts was at 300 cases a day, that's still a pretty high level to be able to successfully identify the source of any one infection. Um, but the data we do have, which is both statewide and in Needham, does point to those social interactions, those family groups and gatherings, rather than to uh, you know, outdoor dining at a restaurant, indoor dining at a restaurant, rather than shopping. Um, those have not been, uh, to anyone's knowledge, a significant driver of infection. And uh, indoor dining or gym? Gyms, and I think some of the data is still out, but gyms have a number of sort of operating restrictions on them, even though they, they have been able to open um, and have not been as significant a source of infection as was originally thought. Um, I think it's all about comfort and risk level. And I will tell you that um, the exercise I'm getting is outdoor exercise right now. I don't think it necessarily is the, the best plan to indoor nine, but that's, I'm uh, sorry, indoor exercise at a gym, but that's sort of how people have to understand their risk and sort of figure out what their own comfort level is with risk. Um, but it has not been the significant driver of infection in comparison to this family and social interactions. And what about indoor dining? So the, the data is still a little bit mixed because a lot of places um, are having more outdoor dining than indoor dining, like more, more seating outside than inside. Obviously that's gonna change as the weather uh, grows colder. Um, but it has not been as significant a source of infection as was originally thought. I think part of the reason is that 
Massachusetts still has not allowed sort of bars to come back in the same way. You know, we, there's alcohol service at seated tables, um, but that attracts potentially a different crowd and that's a different type of interaction than people kind of crowding around a bar, talking loudly, having many multiple drinks. Um, in close contact. Right, if, if you know, uh, five people sitting around a table sharing a bottle of wine is different than, um, yeah, people crowding around the bar trying to get a bunch more beers or some shots or something. So we will. Yeah, this, uh, you mentioned three revised executive orders. One was the face covering. The second was the curfew. What's the third? Gosh, I'm going to ask record. me that. Uh, give me one second. <laughs> So the type of thing I should remember, but I think it slips from me every day a little bit. Um, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, here it is. It it does revise their limits on outdoor gatherings. Um, so the size of an outdoor gathering, uh, and this in this sense, we're not talking about like um, at a park. We're talking about private residences. So uh, no more than ten people can gather indoors at private residences. Uh, no more than 25 people can gather outdoors at a private residence. Um, other venues that, that have already been sort of subject to very specific state guidance can keep operating at those levels, but it restricts um, bringing down from um, 50 and 25 to 25 and 10, the size of um, gatherings that you could have, the size of like a backyard barbecue or a party in your house. Um, and that is in line with the data we've seen because we've seen those as a significant driver of infections. Uh, in the Commonwealth, in Needham, we haven't had a ton of large parties like that. We've had a handful of gatherings that have produced um, cases. I know that people probably have paid attention to things like Franklin had to, uh, with very little notice, had to cancel school on Sunday night and Monday because there was a very large house party over uh, Halloween that drew, I think, 50 or 60 high school kids. Um, Needham has been fortunate to avoid situations like that so far. Thank you very much. Uh, does... Um... Anyone else have a question for Tim? Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious if, if the uh, data that you work with shows anything um, focused on the people who work in the restaurants, the people who work in the grocery stores. Um, I get this sense, I hear repeatedly that it's not a source of concern for the customer, but I'm always curious as to whether the staff at say Trader Joe's is uh, more exposed than most and whether that's showing up in data. We, um, so in Needham, that has not been a significant source of infection. Um, I don't know, I can't, can't speak necessarily for how they feel psychologically. Um, I will say that we have gotten a number of complaints um, and this is sort of to be expected about businesses um, or about people going into businesses. You know, someone went into a business and their mask wasn't covering their nose. We get very frequent complaints about that. So my staff does go to businesses remind them of the rules, try to talk to them. Oftentimes the business is making every effort to comply. It's a customer uh, that is creating a challenging situation by sort of not following the rules. Um, and another customer who grant, you know, glances at that and may not have seen that the manager went up to that person two minutes before and said, you know, sir or ma'am, we need you to put up their ma your mask. Um, Needham's businesses, and, and there are one or two exceptions, but Needham's businesses have been very compliant. Um, and have been very good about following the rules. Every time there's sort of revised state guidance, we talk to them. They're very conscientious about trying to protect their customers and their workers. Um, I don't know, you know, I can't tell you how the average worker at Trader Joe's feels, except for the fact that I go in there multiple times a week to pay the grocery bill for the senior center. And I see very high levels of compliance among um, the customers and I see 100% compliance among the staff. Um, Does that answer your question, David? Yes, thank you. I just I have a question. Yes, Virginia. So, Tim, do you think the rules will stay pretty much the same for customers and staff? You know, the face mask, hand sanitizer, and keeping distance, or you anticipate that may change as the winter comes on? So, I, I think um, I don't think there's much more that can happen in 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 that sense um, to tighten things. And right now, we're on certainly certain uh, an upward trajectory, and at least the you know, I, I'm not a, um, an epidemiologist, but the, the people I trust say that it's going to you know, continue to accelerate for another few weeks, potentially, uh, and then maybe 
uh, level off at unfortunately a very, very high level. Um, so I don't see any relaxing of those standards anytime soon. I guess the question would be, is there further tightening or further restrictions? Um, and I don't think there is really many options for restrictions on the additional masks. The, the distance is what we have. I think one thing that um, the CDC put out about two or three weeks ago um, for the definition of a close contact. So that's uh, when there is a case, we do the contact tracing. We try to figure out who was in close contact to that person. We strongly recommend that person get tested and we require as public health authorities for them to quarantine. CDC changed the definition of close contact to not be 15 minutes of exposure to if Adam and I were talking in close proximity for 15 minutes, he would be a close contact of mine. Um, they changed it to a cumulative 15 minutes. Uh, and that's based on some observations they had from a, a prison in Vermont actually, where uh, a guard had multiple sort of one to two minute interactions with um, uh, inmates who had COVID and then he got COVID even though he spent a total of 17 minutes with them over a shift. Um, so it's, you know, that sort of those brief interactions can add up. Um, that does make it a little bit more challenging to contact trace. It also makes it more important for people to um, sort of understand the definition of close contact, which is six feet regardless, within six feet, regardless of whether you have a mask or not. And for that 15 minutes cumulative. Um, we're trying to sort of figure out the exact public messaging, but our board chair uh, for the Board of Health, Kathleen uh, Ward-Brown talks about people sort of having a, a social contact budget. Uh, and so you don't want to sort of spend all of your time interacting with someone and increase your exposure. So trying to sort of think about it and manage your time and how closely you're interacting with someone and really cut it off, you know, at the five or six or seven minute mark and not get to the point where you're potentially a close contact to that person and you've increased your exposure to COVID. Thank you. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, one last question I guess that I have is you had mentioned that in Needham, one of the largest drivers of cases is youth sports. Do you anticipate um, uh, any guidance on uh, youth sports going forward, especially as we head into, you know, the Thanksgiving period where we expect people at, you know, multiple parties at various houses and so on, and we're weeks away from that now? Sure, so a, a couple of things on that front. Um, the governor and the state have promised revised guidance um, by the end of the week. So I think I'm, I'm interested to see that. Um, anyone who's using a, a Needham owned field has had to submit sort of a safety plan to the Park and Rec Commission and to myself for review. And I, I review that against state guidance and my own understanding of public health best practices and give them feedback and have them tweak things. Um, our sports have, especially the ones in town have been run very well. I think what we have seen is some cases associated with indoor ice hockey. Uh, and people might have known that, um, you know, New Hampshire put a pause in uh, ice hockey about three weeks ago, about a week later, the state put a pause in indoor ice hockey. Um, that fits what we know about sort of the, the physics or the aerodynamics, for lack of a better word, of virus transmission. We know that droplets have an easier time staying aloft in the air um, in cold, dry weather, as opposed to warm, humid weather. And if you think about a hockey rink, that's pretty cold, dry weather. Um, I think one of our big questions, um, and we also did this with the high school, um, Dan Lee, uh, the athletic director of the high school, and Mike, the assistant director, came up with a very detailed plan of how to do their fall sports in a safe manner. Um, they were talking to me earlier this week about their plans for the winter, and I think winter is much more complicated, right? In the, the fall, we're talking about, um, you know, soccer, uh, women's field hockey, things like that, cross country. In the winter, you're talking about wrestling, which I, I honestly don't think there'd be any way to do safely. Um, you're talking potentially about basketball, which presents some real challenges. You're talking about ice hockey, which presents some real challenges because you're inside. I mean, I think people understand one of the basics about COVID is you're better off outside than inside because there is airflow and particles are dispersed. Um, you're much better off. And it's getting to the point where it's not possible to do outdoor dining than indoor dining. Um, there's definitely ways to do indoor dining in a safer manner, but Outdoor dining is far safer just because of the fact that there's air movement and circulation and droplets don't hang the same way they would in a, uh, in a room. Okay, uh, that's uh, helpful for now at this point. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Tim before we jump into 
other um, other subjects. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, we're grateful for your ongoing participation uh, in these meetings. It's very important information. It's helpful for businesses to understand and to educate their customers um, and employees on uh, the source of spread and uh, you know any other guidance that you and the state are rolling out or anticipate. Um, we're grateful again. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, my pleasure. Um, and Adam, I've mentioned it before, but if um, if you or Amy want to pass along my contact information again to the, the folks on this call, if there are businesses that have questions, if they want to sort of talk through, you know, if they're concerned about making modifications to their operations, we're happy to, to have a conversation or to do a Zoom meeting with them, um, whatever we can do to sort of support people, making sure their operations are safe and healthy for themselves and their customers, we're happy to do. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take an opportunity now to uh, return the conversation to uh, uh, business and understand some of the challenges and solutions, uh, particularly anything that new that we have not otherwise already discussed. Uh, I would love to get a snapshot of, of uh, the office uh, in particular. I may kick it off with, uh, with Adam and then with Mike and uh, others to come. Sure. So um, thanks, Adam. It's the last like three weeks or so have actually been pretty quiet. Um, I mean, our business is, as Bob and Mike will, will attest to, you know, kind of comes in waves, uh, I would say, and rate, you know, from, from June 1st up until call it Labor Day or so, uh, or a little bit after was, was pretty active um, in our experience. But I'd say in the last like three weeks, it's, it's definitely um, tailed off in terms of you know, actual tours as well as inquiries. Um, there's no, you know, I don't know exactly why. I mean, perhaps some of those people that had to actually take action because their leases were expiring, you know, actually did that. Um, and then there's like that next wave that are, you know, trying to kick the can as long as possible in terms of, you know, having to deal with it just to see how, how this plays out. I mean, I think the first wave had, you know, it took a lot longer than, than anybody thought and they still don't really have the answers, but had to, you know, do something at that point. But um, I'd say, yeah, I mean, it's definitely slower now um, than it was before, but I mean, the feedback that we're getting from, from our clients is that they're not going to, you know, necessarily downsize or, or give up the office um, even, um, you know, once this thing passes, I mean, they always want to have some sort of, you know, office and location. Um, one group that actually we're, we're talking to now is in a traditional office, um, actually in Wellesley. And he wants to actually get away from the traditional office and just rent space, like a decent sized space. I mean, he has 70 to eight, 70 to 80 employees, but he just wants to set it up as like, a like a conference center type thing where he can have like full, you know, company meetings as well as, you know, several individual conference rooms. Um, and then maybe a couple like workstations where they can, you know, go and plug in uh, for a few hours, but, um, and then have, you know, not everyone there every day, but, you know, most of them are work remotely and just, you know, go in and, and use that facility when, you know, when they need it, which I thought was interesting. Um, just the first one that I've heard. Uh, how many square feet of space are they in or are they looking for? I'm just curious. They're in like, uh, I think about six or seven thousand, uh, yeah, six or seven thousand square feet now. And they want probably, you know, somewhere between like five and six or five and seven. Okay, that's helpful. It's interesting. Uh, and that's in part because they are growing as well, um, but they just don't need the actual, you know, traditional office space. Um, but they are you know, growing, so. And when you mentioned that it's, uh, that it's a little uh, softer right now, in comparison to this time last year, is it uh, a little softer than you would anticipate for the fall market in office? Yeah, I mean, usually between like, well, usually the summer is quieter, although the last few years it hasn't been, you know, completely dead at all. Um, and then between like Labor Day and Thanksgiving, it picks up and everyone's trying to get all that, you know, their leasing done um, and renewals or relocations before, or leases signed, I should say, before Thanksgiving. Uh, and then it quiets down significantly between like Thanksgiving and, and New Year's. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really quiet right now. So I think it's, 
there's just so much uncertainty out there that nobody really knows what, you know, what they want to do. So, and I think moving, a lot of people are opting to, to renew rather than actually move unless they, you know, need more space or are looking to downsize. But I, we haven't seen too many groups actually touring the market to downsize. Um, it's been more like lateral moves or expansions um, if they're out looking. So because they need more space to socially distant employees. In some cases, yes. Um, but in some cases, like they're just, they're growing. Um, you know, there are contrary to what you read in the media. I mean, there's, you know, there's still plenty of companies that are growing and hiring right now. So this is obviously a good sign. So. And Mike, uh, what's your experience like in the office sector and I guess lab too? I concur with uh, Adam. It's been a little bit slower the last few weeks. It's hard to sometimes put a finger on it. The market does go in sort of cycles. So maybe we're just in one of those quieter ones now. We have about a million square feet in Needham Newton, and we've been fortunate enough to sign uh, four new leases in the last few weeks. Uh, demand coming from more traditional law, insurance. Uh, we have a medical dental group going into a building on 2nd Ave., um, we have a media company that's relocating within um, Edom. They're actually downsizing, I think, um, in part because technology allows them to do so. So, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to onboard uh, while at the same time doing the best that we can to um, retain tenants who have leases expiring. I do have a tenant in one of our buildings who said, Mike, we're not going in there. I haven't been there for seven months. You know, we'll probably be back in the market next summer when we have a better sense of, um, of how we want to proceed. And, you know, to him, I said, look, we'll hold the space for six months. We'll start the lease. You know, the lease expires at the end of the year. We'll, we'll start at 7-1 if you want. And, you know, just keep everything in place and we'll do a new transaction. So we're trying to be as creative as possible, offering some tenants, you know, some inducements, uh, you know, particularly on the renewal side, just to keep people and keep them in the game. Because I think when things do resume, you know, next year to what we hope to be an adjusted uh, perception of the market. Um, you know, they're going to need their space and they're, they're going to want to stay in the space. But right now, perceptions about what their needs are tend to be all over the place. And most of our tech companies, like over at 117, Kendrick, um, you know, there, there isn't many cars there. Um, so they're, they're basically embrace work from home. And, you know, they see it as something that's going to, I think, um, be part of how they conduct business for a um, considerable amount of time going forward. We did just finalize one lab lease um, in Cambridge, which brings a building of about 300,000 square feet to 100% completion. Um, so that lab market is percolating along. And, you know, from what I understand, and, and Adam can probably uh, confirm as well, you know, places like Waltham, Lexington, Watertown are still seeing the benefits of um, reposition properties that support Support, um, lab and um, yeah, that, that sector of the market, along with uh, industrials, Rick mentioned in our last call, uh, tends to be sort of holding their own and, and um, being somewhat robust where everything else is uh, pretty much on hold right now, it seems. That's hey, Mike, I have a question for you. It's Adam Meixner. Um, so at 117 Kendrick, you have Work Bar, which for those of you who don't know, is like a co working. Um, group curious do you have any idea how they're doing in terms of you know occupancy i mean the building engineer who runs that uh, facility says it's the busiest uh, suite in the uh, in the building i don't know if that's uh, you know just by comparison to everyone being so quiet but um you know we do have a property uh, a couple properties down in um in hingham on derby street where regis is a tenant as many of you know, they're, um, they file for bankruptcy and they're gonna sort of select uh, locations uh, that they wanna retain. We're hopeful they'll, they'll keep that one because that one tends to be busy too. But you know, the co-working, I, you know, at this point, I'm not sure if they are insulated from this. Um, you know, you certainly go into a WeWork or a work bar and it's, they're doing you know, their best to keep people uh, social distance and whatnot, but their model is much more open space. Um, although they do have sort of work areas that different, you know, smaller organizations can work within, you know, cells, if you will, within their space. But um, I think the jury's still out as to whether that's uh, going to be sort of a vehicle um, 
I know Lise, you're over at um, the Staples um, facility as well. I don't know if you have any comments about uh, how things are going with their sort of co-working location on um, on Needham on Highland Ave. Lise, do you have any comment? I may have. You're at least you're on. You're yes, mute. No. Yes. No. I would have. I don't have any other inside knowledge on that. How do you observe you got the occupancy overall with the work with the uh, shared working space at Staples? I actually do not go to that office. Um, that is meant for Catherine and Tiffany for more of the operations people that need to go in and do printing and signage. And we do do this archaic certificate of origin um, that our members still need at times. Um, and it's a very small office and it's actually quite crowded outside. Um, we, we're not in the co-working space. We're out by the TSA, which amazingly there's always long lines for TSA. So we're out by the printer center and we're not really even supposed to utilize what's going on back in this studio space. Okay. Uh, Rick, what, uh, what's your experience like with industrial space? Uh, <clears throat> I would mirror uh, uh, Mike's comments. He, he pretty much covered it. Uh, uh, demand for laboratory and uh, industrial warehouse distribution space uh, from logistics standpoint, e-commerce e business. It's uh, the demand is driving uh, that need out to the suburbs. Um, and as you know, anything inside of 128 or even along 128 for the most part uh, of, of, uh, of warehouse distribution type of space has, has long since been torn down and, and uh, uh, they've, they've uh, developed office or, or some other higher and better use. So we're starting to see you know, activity uh, along the 495 belt uh, really pick up. Um, and from the lab space standpoint, uh, uh, to reiterate what Mike was saying, uh, uh, that, that market seems to be so hot, they, they, they are land constricted and building constricted, and they keep on moving out through uh, the various tentacles, out Route 2, out to 128. Um, and, you know, with, uh, and, and, and Adam, uh, along with this, I'd, I'd like to hear an update from the residential side, because you're, you're seeing, I think, a lot of the... Uh, the workforce starting to uh, uh, get, give up on the, uh, the urban living and uh, wanting, wanting to move out to the suburbs. So that also uh, affects the uh, demand for those types of properties. So I can certainly speak to that. We're, f we're finding the, the greater residential trend uh, is uh, a lack of inventory. Um, and that's, uh, that's been true for six years, which has been driving uh, substantial price increases. Um, the local market, the local market remains uh, um, ro robust. Uh, for example, I sold uh, my neighbor's house um, in, in less than 24 hours on the market over ask cash and with no inspection contingency. And I provide those details just so people understand that how uh, competitive it, you know, the market can be in the residential sector. Um, uh, and um, homes that, see, that are priced right for their condition and location are moving, at ver you know, are, are moving very quickly and uh, prices, you know, demand remains strong. And we haven't seen an adverse effect on the mortgage sector yet. So therefore uh, money is relatively inexpensive and people are able to utilize it to, uh, to find homes. As the market's a little softer as you go a little farther out towards Hopkinton, Holliston, that area, um, uh, um, but by and large, the residential market is pretty strong outside. The, um, I have a number of clients that own multifamilies that rent out and uh, the college, which is typically driven by young professionals and students. And that market has definitely softened in a substantial way, driven largely because of um, what's happening on, on campuses. Um, 
you know, uh, Rick, you, you mentioned something interesting, which I think there was an article in the New York Times. The, uh, the Brookings Institute had made uh, um, an observation that there has been a reverse of a trend in 2010. There had been a residential trend for increased demand in, uh, in metro space. In other words, for residences inside big cities. And 10 years later, now in uh, 2020, the opposite is true. There has been a greater push pr uh, prior to um, COVID for uh, demand in the suburban market and, and, away pe and people are driving away from um, uh, living in the cities. So that's the, uh, you know, supported by the Brookings Institute uh, research and observations. So uh, to return back to Adam and, and Mike, um, Bob and Rick, what are you seeing happening on the uh, rent prices? Are they remaining stable? Have they adjusted up or down? In the office, you know, sector in our area, they haven't gone down. Um, and I think I might have mentioned this last time, you know, everything you read in the media, you can't believe um, right now because it is, you know, the office market is definitely hurting. Um, there's a ton of sublease space on the market, particularly downtown, uh, but that's sublease space, right? So a lot of these landlords haven't felt the pain from, you know, a lot of these tenants not renewing or, or vacating um, the buildings. So, I mean, commercial real estate tends to lag a bit from the rest of the economy. Um, in Needham though, I would say, you know, more specifically, there hasn't been a significant amount of, of sublease space that's come on the market. And while it is, you know, a little bit quieter now, um, you know, landlords are, are reluctant to, to start dropping prices. I mean, they may be offering a little more by way of, you know, tenant improvement allowance or, or free rent, um, but they wanna try and maintain those higher price per square foot you know, rents, um, you know, for their, you know, for the lenders and everything like that. Um, so I really haven't seen much, you know, wiggle room on, on that. Any of the others that are uh, not on camera uh, <laughs> want to make a, an additional comment to that? Is that consistent, Mike and Rick? I mean, again, we have not seen a major change in, in pricing um, for new tenants. I think, you know, as I said before, we're trying to be as creative as possible with existing tenants to retain them. Um, and, you know, given different business models that our tenants are in, we have some that do some uh, programming and, uh, and um, events that they just can't uh, do right now and support their businesses. Um, you know, we have a, a group over at 251st that does just like biomedical conferences and, you know, they're, they're trying to make sense of it with the online side of things. But, um, you know, again, even on the retail side where we have some, uh, some exposure there too, it's just keep people in their seats if we can and do what we need to listen to what their needs are and try and address them in a way that uh, retains them uh, in occupancy and gets us to a better, better place, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, Tina. One, one, Adam, one thing, oh. Adam, one thing, one thing we have been saying, uh, I've been saying anyway, is that transaction times have, have significantly lengthened for getting deals done due mainly to, uh, to try to schedule a, scheduling third parties for due diligence, uh, the environmental guys, uh, uh, people doing uh, the, the surveyors. We, we had one instance where, uh, where a buyer couldn't get a uh, surveyor to commit to do the work for eight to 12 weeks out. So in a, in a typical deal, you might have, uh, you go under agreement, you have a, let's say a 30 or even a 45 day due diligence and 30 days to close. That those time frames have lengthened out because the third parties aren't available to get the work done on a timely basis. And even from the banking standpoint, if it's if it's being financed through a bank, uh, you know uh, the committee process sometimes gets a little lengthened because of uh, they're not meeting uh, on, on the schedule that they used to meet. You know, in a in a conference room to go over deals, they're meeting on Zoom meetings like this. 
Um, so that that has significantly lengthened that time frame from uh, accepted deal to to closing in some instances. Thank you. Um, uh, excuse excuse me, Adam. Yes, I have to leave the meeting. I understand. Thank All you right. Very much. Thank you very much. Stay safe out there. Very good. Thank you. Tina, what's your experience with retail activity? Um, it's been good for those of us that are still hanging in. Uh, the holiday shopping season started very early. So um, we've been actually pretty busy with uh, customers coming in. I think a lot of people are afraid that there's gonna be another shutdown. So they're trying to get in what they can before um, things get a little crazy. I mean, it's sad on my block alone. I've got leases closed. You guys know about the garden center. Mostly Gray's got a for, for lease sign up that's just on this block. So I think by the time, you know, the end of the year rolls around, Needham's gonna look kind of decimated between the retail and the restaurant closings that are happening. And what do you, do you see as uh, what needs do you see for retail that can help abate that? I mean, Amy's been really good about uh, helping us figure out strategies. We're talking about staying open late, um, doing some cross promotion between restaurants and retailers. Um, I don't really think that what's happening with the election is gonna help over the next couple of weeks. And we have such a short time to get holiday shopping in. So that is gonna definitely be a concern for everybody. Um, I mean, I don't know at this point, you know, it's, we're so late into the game. It's not like we can just sort of come up with a strategy. Now it's work with what you've got, try to, try to finish the year strong and sort of reassess January come Lee, January. Uh, Lise, what are you finding with, uh, uh, uh with your member, with your retail membership? No, pretty much, um, what Tina is saying, um, you know, the stores that are busy are busy and the stores that are not, there's, there's just not much you can do to drive people into stores if they are nervous about going in or if they don't have a need at this time. Um, you know, hopefully the holidays will push everybody out to do that. We did just order another hundred signs from Staples for open for curbside pickup, thinking that if it does get restricted again, people will still order online and come in and pick stuff up. So that's going, um, those signs are available for both restaurants and retail. Our 100 day challenge, you know, we have really nice community support for that. That's just to really get the message out about supporting your local people. That doesn't, you know, how much that is driving actual purchasing, I don't know, but it's rallying around that community. Um, we're going to um, start including information about Needham Lights. Amy gave me information to include. So in my weekly updates, we'll try to get people to rally around that tradition. I um, mean, that's just pretty much stores decorating. Um, so giving the center a sense of life and community. Um, bring together. Thank you to the select board. They okayed signs um, for the first time for us to be able to put up signs outside town hall and in Avery Square to support them. Um, shop local, dine local. Um, the public schools stepped up. We were allowed to drop off. The chamber gave 10 signs to the public schools. And I live right near Pollard and Webster, I mean, and on the high school. And it was really nice to see those signs out there for the first time. Um, so thank you for the coordination on that. Um, you know, we're just trying as much as we can to let the community know how important it is. Is there, so is there uh, a plan? I think, um, Tina, you had mentioned uh, um, an open late program. Is that tied into the need of light so that, um, and is that type of event in part designed to drive retail activity? Amy, I think Amy can speak more to that. Sure. So we're trying to coordinate everything um, together to uh, emphasis on the importance of supporting the retailers. So, um, you know, I, we're hesitating using the word event uh, because I think that that um, starts to conjure up images of large crowds um, but I think expanding the hours for retailers on Thursday evenings, um, which by the way, the date to start that is uh, to be determined. I'm in touch with the retailers right now to see if we can get a collective uh, group of folks to commit to starting on a certain day. 
Uh, but it, the success of that is really going to entail having a core group of retailers uh, commit to doing so and, and helping to spread the word. So I'm working closely with Cindy um, Gonzalez, the chief, uh, sorry, the town's public information officer to help spread the word on that. And I'll certainly be in touch with the chamber to see how we can uh, you know, utilize them to help spread the word. But, um, you know, the, the hope is to be able to provide opportunities for folks to come down and support, um, you know, the, the retailers um, by doing cross promotions, as Tina mentioned, with the restaurants, I'm going to be in touch with them to see if we can get folks to, for example, take their receipt from a purchase from a retailer in Needham Center for that day, and whether they get some kind of incentive or discount, um, what have you, for those Thursday evenings that we're coordinating the Thursday night promotions. What about doing something like, um, you know how they have like farmer's markets and everything where on like a Saturday, all the retailers are, you know, go out, they set up shop. Obviously it's impossible for you know, people like Tina to bring their whole store, but at least it, it you know, gives people like a, a a taste or a flavor of like what they're, you know, what they're selling or what their style is. And that way people may be more comfortable with, with visiting, you know, walking around there and seeing it. And then Tina can always say, all right, well, if you like this, you know, coat, let's say, then, then, you know, our closet or our, our closet, our um, store is right around the corner there and on Great Plain and, you know, feel free to, to go by there. Have they looked at anything like that or? So I don't want to speak for, for Tina, but I, I think generally speaking, it's a matter of staffing for um, some of the retailers not being able to provide staff to be at, you know, um, a satellite location as well as in the store themselves. Um, the tent on the common is being removed, at least it hasn't already. Um, so we wouldn't have an actual spot that would provide any kind of shelter. And again, um, I think there's hesitation to have folks congregate in one area. So any kind of market um, at this point is not being considered. In fact, I figured like maybe more around the perimeter. So it is like spread out and all like inside is all like wide open and, and everything, but I, it makes sense about staffing too, so. When the farmer's market was going through the permitting process, there was great discussion and restraints um, considered by the Department of Health to be able to a limit the amount of people all at once that would uh, converge in that particular geography and to spread it out as much as they could. For instance, there was, uh, I think um, uh, they, they reduced the number of vendors and they reduced the number of, um, I think uh, artists as well, um, just to try and keep a safe social distance. So. It, I'm not uh, aware of uh, a desire from a safety point of view to expand the footprint, uh, but I'm sure that there is a desire to expand the retail activity. And what else can you know? Can we be doing, you know, to that end? What's the demand like for parking? Is you know, is um, can people can retailers? Uh, uh, utilize the parking space in another way that can help drive traffic? I can speak anecdotally and say that the demand for parking has not been uh, particularly high. There seems to always be plenty of inventory um, on the street and in the lots um, in and around Needham Center. Um, I did visit with several of the retailers who originally expressed interest in wanting to expand their merchandising outside of their front um, you know, the front door, um, in particular, secondhand rows expressed interest in doing so. I went and visited with them and we took a look at the area and their sidewalks, there are very narrow. So if they uh, wanted to expand their merchandising with a pop-up tent to provide shelter from you know, the elements, it would have entailed putting the pedestrian way in the on-street parking spaces. And upon re further reflection, they decided that they did not want to give up the you know two parking spaces in front of their shop because they felt they were it was more valuable to provide those spaces not only for you know their shop but their neighbors as well. Interesting. At least is are there um, other options that are being that uh, uh, that your group is considering to help boost retail activity and with restaurants? Um, yeah. 
well, we have our restaurant promotion going and we have a retail effort going. So there's at this point, we're going to wait in here. Um, this is the first time I'm hearing about the Thursday night cross promotion. That could be, you know, I think it's just a matter of having to get residents to come out and shop. And we're, we'll amplify any type of effort, but our, you know, our niche is really business to business. So we would just help, love any help that we can to expand the voice across the community. Do you have a sense yeah. Lisa, of how much your membership is um, uh, prepared for online transactions? Uh, we have not polled our retailers like that. I mean, Tina might have a better idea. I do know, I know the ones that are doing it successfully and it's, you know, Tina um, and Proud Mary converted to online. Um, but no, I'm not sure if Tin Rabbit has an online site, site or not. I do know I they're, think, they're all yeah. very active on social media, which is great. You know, it's like a, a whole nother business, right? Yeah. So to try to scramble in the middle of March when you're finding out that you have to shut down your physical space, that's nearly impossible unless you have the resources. So no. most, so most people Adam, don't have them. Adam, could yeah. you also uh, ask Amy to talk a little bit about the barriers which are gonna be coming down? Please. Sure, so um, at the end of this month, the uh, two parklets that have that were created. So the one in front of French Press on Chapel Street, as well as the one on Great Plain Ave in front of Sweet Basil, those will be removed. Um, I have been in touch with both owners um, to talk about you know, their interest in plans um, as far as continuing outdoor dining. Um, I should add that I did attend um, about a week and a half ago, actually maybe I think it was last week, uh, a meeting of the Newton Needham Dining Collaborative in which I was invited and Jay Spencer uh, French Press actually heads that group and expressed interest on behalf of many Needham restaurants that they want to expand outdoor dining. So I've since brought it back. Um, we have actually met this morning before this meeting, there's a downtown working group. Um, Mo is, is part of that as well as uh, Mary and Cooley. And we discussed um, actually going to not only the planning board, but the select board to expand um, in the way that Newton has. So it would be 60 days post um, the declaration. So when the state of emergency ends um, in Massachusetts per the governor, it would allow the towns to uh, expand the outdoor dining up to 60 days past that. So I reached out to the two owners of the parklets um, that I just mentioned, French Press, a Sweet Basil, and they are looking to have the seating in front of their storefronts. Outdoor dining has decreased dramatically uh, given you know, obviously the snow last Friday, but also the cooler temperatures. And Sweet Basil, for example, would like to keep a couple of two tops out in front of their storefront, not only for people that may choose to do, have outdoor dining, but for folks who are waiting for a table inside, it gives them a place to wait. Um, French press already had the ability to have tables in front of their storefront, but to keep them six foot distance, um, they can only fit two. So they're looking to utilize the um, alleyway space between themselves and the cleaners. Um, so, you know, plans are in place uh, as far as moving forward to get the formal approval to expand the outdoor dining, just the event that there are mild days and the restaurants want to you know, have that as an option. Um, we're also looking into the potential of having some um, designated curbside pickup spots, not only for retail, but for restaurants throughout uh, Needham Center to make it convenient for folks to be able to pull up and, and you know. That's a great idea. Ordered, uh, you know, something from one of the retail shops to be able to pick it up or from one of the restaurants for, for takeout. So that's in the works as well. And it, were those uh, barriers or uh, barricades removed as a result largely of uh, snow to facilitate or allow for snow plowing? It's, that, sorry. it's also a, the demand for outdoor eating is drying up. Right, maybe I mentioned that. So it's a combination, but it's primarily due to the lack of demand for outdoor dining. It, on, the, on the rights of way, we don't know about Chapel Street. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm way to have a question. Oh, please, Virginia. Um, I maybe we've discussed this before, but I noticed yesterday the big sign coming into town um, advertising for snowplow operators. 
-hmm. But could that also be used to promote the shop dine local? Um, well, I have the sign in my yard, but I'm just one person with one yard sign and that flashing light sign is you catch a lot of eyes. I mean, we can certainly run that request to Kate. She has authority over what we put on the sign. So um, I think it may have come up before, but I don't recall. It did. We have been trying to get that messaging on that sign. Thank you for buying a sign, Virginia. I, I'd like to know uh, 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 chat uh, about uh, any update from Amy a report from our economic development manager. Sure, so to continue uh, the conversation, uh, just to update folks, uh, these have already been announced, but uh, businesses in Needham that have closed, uh, everyone's aware of three squares that announced several weeks ago. Stacy's Juice Bar recently announced on social media that they will be closing at the end of the month, which is very disappointing but understandable. Um, and then the Art Emporium, Lisa's Boutique and Polywogs um, are all, so Art Emporium and Lisa's Boutique um, had already announced that Polywogs, I think I had mentioned at, a, at another meeting as well, they'll be closing at the end of the year. And as Tina just mentioned, Mostly Gray has a four lease sign in front of their storefront now. So um, you know, certainly the con concern is that we may be seeing more of this. Um, so I've been in regular contact with the small businesses um, and reaching out not only just to check in, but also to be able to share resources and information with them. So for example, um, when we learned last week that um, there's $51 million in funding through the Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporations for small businesses, I let the small business community uh, know right away that this was an opportunity um, sharing links of free webinars, the Center for Women in Enterprise, the Small Business Administration, International Downtown Group, and certainly the Chamber of Commerce has been fantastic in offering online sort of technical assistance and you know, discussions and trainings. Um, I'm, I've been attending a lot of webinars. Uh, for example, next week I'm attending one on um, Google Business and just learning, you know, the, the ins and outs of helping local businesses to sign up for Google business because it's free. And so, and as we're continuing to, you know, find ways to support the local businesses, if these, if there are free tools out there for folks to be able to find them very easily. Um, and then I'm actually attending a webinar early, later today, finding new revenue streams for retail and restaurants. Um, and I shared that with uh, local retailers and restaurants as well. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of webinars out there, a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, I know that the business owners, it's really hard for them to break out in the middle of the day, especially, you know, they're in their uh, respective businesses. So my hope is to you know, be able to attend as much as is possible and then pass along the information and the links to the recording so that they can maybe, you know, offer them, I'm sorry, review them um, off hours. Um, so that's going on. We already talked about the Thursday night, um, late night, so I'll keep you posted on when that's gonna kick off. Um, and then I've applied to be a neighborhood partner for the National Small Business Saturday promotion. Uh, that's now gonna be in its 10th year, so I'm waiting to hear on that. Um, let's see, the Needham 100 Day Challenge, Lisa already provided everyone an update on that. And then um, every other Wednesday, so today is uh, happening again. I have, I have a bi-weekly meeting with the economic development directors from area um, greater Boston area and we share ideas and what's going on in different communities. Um, and I just also recently attended a webinar on winter placemaking. It was held by the Mass Downtown Initiative and it talked about different ideas that communities can embrace to help drive more foot traffic to you know, the small business community. And there was a lot of great ideas. Uh, many of them are very costly and may not be feasible to be able to, um, you know, do in, in, in Needham anywhere, you know, some of them include, for example, you know, having bonfires and open flames, but, um, you know, we're expanding uh, outdoor dining. So these were ideas that were solicited from across the country and compiled into um, this pretty awesome presentation. Um, so there's, you know, vacation on Main Street and um, having 
you know, as, as Adam uh, Meisner brought up a short while ago, uh, kiosks from different retailers and restaurants. So, you know, closing down the street, maybe actually having kiosks outside of their actual storefronts to make it sort of a street activity. Um, that's another thing. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of things, there's lots of information out there. It's just sort of finding the ones that are going to work for, you know, for, for Needham. And, and, you know, what's happening is that we've got all these other communities that are experiencing the same thing. So when I have this bi-weekly meeting, I sort of go around and, and everyone is, again, searching for that, you know, that idea that's going to, you know, help support the small business community, sort of that, that magic bullet. And it's, it's not out there. I think we're all collectively doing the right things to bring attention to the importance of supporting small businesses. Um, but it's, it's, you know, the tangible things that we can do um, to support the retailers and restaurants that are, that are really going to make a difference. Not, to that point, uh, Amy and I had talked a little bit about this uh, earlier in the week, and I, I'll probably, uh, I'd like to mention it to everybody, and Lisa might find this helpful too. A number of uh, universities and colleges and, uh, re and retail trade associations publish varying degrees of uh, trade journals or scholarly publications that uh, that discuss and analyze different aspects of retail activity. Some of it has to do with logistics and supply chain management. Some of it has to do with finance. But there are from time to time some tidbits about how different types of businesses in uh, uh, retail businesses, restaurants that may be surviving uh, through the pandemic uh, that may be able to offer some additional suggestions and observations. So we have a chance, any of us to, you know, to uh, review a number of probably back issues uh, through probably April. Um, we might be able to share some of those uh, comments and feedback that may be able to help, you know, our local business. I know Lise, you've worked, you know, you are working very hard through the chamber um, uh, through a number of different programs to promote shop local, dine local, uh, and um, you know we're coming into the you know this tougher period in the winter. And you know, like Tina mentioned, and Amy had talked about, there are a number of closures already, and unfortunately, there'll be a you know more to come. So you know we can all be an agent for for change in the sense that whenever we have uh, just for the members of our committee and our and our immediate families, if anyone has a need for you know a holiday gift, please think of our local business. Um, if anyone uh, you know our wives, our husbands, kids, if they have a need for a particular type of purchase, please think of. For that matter, a car. Please think of our local uh, business. I should also say a truck or an SUV to get you to the stores. Please think of our local business. Um, Lee, do you uh, have any updates on uh, business permits issued? Uh, sure. Um, I spoke about, I think, most of these projects at the last meeting, but for those who weren't there, I can provide um, an update. Um, the planning board did issue um, a special permit to Petco, um, which is now going to permit for vet veterinary services um, at that property. Um, pending uh, tonight, the planning board is meeting and we have a public hearing scheduled on an application from TripAdvisor to um, basically install a fuel cell on their property. Um, and the purpose of this project is to reduce, I think, the electrical and heating costs um, while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the proposal is for the fuel cell to be mounted on a structural steel platform spanning a loading dock fronting B Street across from the Coca-Cola uh, building facility. So the planning board is going to be hearing that um, project uh, tonight. Um, moving forward, um, on November 17th, the planning board is, has two um, applications that were filed that will be of interest to this group. Um, the first is um, Children's Hospital, um, and they're coming in to amend basically the special permit um, at Center 128 West. Um, so at this time, they're asking to basically construct um, Building 1, which is the building next to um, TripAdvisor, um, to a building of approximately 224,000 square feet for their pediatric medical facility. 
and at this time to complete the construction of uh, building B, which was only, which has been built, being built in phases, but this is the last phase um, to which they would be adding 530 parking spaces. Um, and they're also talking about providing for 105 surface parking spaces at 37A Street um, on a temporary basis. And then as it relates the other two buildings in covered under that permit, um, they're they're currently planning on retaining that as office use. Um, and so it's anticipated that the, you know, the hearing will be held on the 17th. Um, the planning board has contracted with Beta to do a peer review of the traffic study that's been provided. And I think the goal was to get this permit processed and issued um, by the end of this calendar year. And then the other project that the planning board um, will be hearing on the 17th relates to what at 140 Kendrick Street, which was the prior parametrics facility, which is now proposed to be occupied by IDG. Um, and so there they're looking at making changes to the property that will allow it to function as a multi-tenanted building where previously you had, you had one singular tenant. So they're adding, they're modifying um, the first floor space, I think, in building one to allow for gym use and a common cafeteria. Uh, they're changing some of the pedestrian linkages. They're adding a patio at the rear of the building and they're reinforcing the trail linkages down to Cutler Lake. So that's pretty much it um, in terms of the projects the planning board is looking at. Thank you very much, Lippy. Um, Does anybody else have any other business? I'd like to just add one more thing that really wasn't a project-based thing, and that is to give people an update on the Highway Commercial 1 rezoning. Um, we have the traffic study, and there's the, the, um, the working group um, is going to be meeting tomorrow um, for a preliminary meeting with myself and Tony Delgazo, the town engineer, to review um, the results of that study. And we're scheduling a formal presentation by the traffic um, firm that did the analysis, GPI. Um, for November the 18th, which will be a presentation of the results of the study. And so members of this group, that will be a public meeting or that, that will be done as part of a planning board meeting and multiple boards will be invited to hear that presentation. And this group might be interested in sitting in on that, on that presentation as well. I, I think it's worth uh, noting a couple of things. One, that um, the, uh, that the traffic study was based on, uh, I think an FAR of 1.35, Lee, is that right? And roughly 866,000 square feet of space, which was uh, modeled as uh, I think 42 and a half percent of that 866,000 square feet of space for office, another 42 and a half percent for R&D which is a total of 85% and then 15% was for effectively uh, ancillary uh, retail space. Is that right, Lee? That is correct. Okay. So, um, uh, it, you know, this is obviously something that the council had been contemplating uh, many years ago and for many years. Um, if anyone has any uh, comment, um, uh, or suggestions on uh, some of the model or uh, influencing factors that would be helpful because the, um, the Highway Commercial One Committee will continue to advance in the process, hopefully uh, to be able to make a presentation again at town meeting in, in May. Um, so we may wanna uh, dive in on this uh, uh, soon. Um, uh, Mike Wilcox, I think I saw your hand came up do you have any additional comments? Uh, no, I didn't raise my hand, but um, as as I would suggest, um, flexibility will be the key for any future use there, uh, so that uh, the potential um, uses can reflect where the market is, whether it be lab, office, or some combination thereof. So, you know, obviously, when you plan a, a project of this size. Uh, like we did this one in Cambridge, it was over 15 years from start to finish or about 800,000 square feet. So there's a lot of market cycles and, and different changes in the market that the um, uh, developer owner is going to need to adapt to in order to be successful and for the town to be successful with them in terms of um, you know, creating a, a value, valuable project and a, and a property tax um, you know, increase for, for that particular area. 
I think that's an important note to ensure that we're as flexible as possible in the zoning structure uh, um, uh, to attract uh, you know uh, various types of development. Um, does anybody else have any other comment or question? Uh, I see two hands up. Uh, I see Lise and I see Mo. Lise, your hand was up first. Well, I don't have it pertaining to Muzzy. I have one other last piece of chamber business. So if Mo has something to do with that question at hand, he should go first. Mo, you're muted. No, I don't have anything on that question. So why doesn't Lise go first and then I can speak? <laughs> Oh, wait, well, thank you very much. Um, so the chamber, you should be seeing this if you're reading Greg's emails, but our huge um, diversity initiative that was part of our 2020 plan is coming to fruition next Thursday. We're releasing our top 50 most distinguished business people of color. And some of you nominated people um, on the list. Others will know many people on the list. So it's going to be announced on Thursday. We have a panel. Um, event happening from 1030 to noon. Registration is free. You can just click on the event information in one of Greg's emails or come to the chamber website, but we're getting a wonderful response. And, um, and actually Muhammad Ali from IDG is sitting on the panel um, and we're welcoming, you know, it'll be our first chance really hearing from him before he moves into the area. So I urge you all to register and zoom in on uh, next Thursday. Thank you very much, Lise. Mo. Yes, and I apologize if this was discussed earlier, I had a distraction here. Um, the select board has on its agenda for next Tuesday, extending the um, ability to permit restaurants for the town manager for outdoor eating and liquor to coincide with 60 days after the governor declares the pandemic over as opposed to the current deadline, which is December 1st, I believe, Amy. Um, did that come up before I, and did I miss it? Yes, that's that's been addressed. Okay, I, I apologize. I just wanted to make sure it came up. Thank you for being mindful and making sure. I appreciate that. Um, does anybody else have any other comment? Uh, seeing none, hearing none, uh, can I please have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Virginia moves, and do I have a second? Second. A second by David. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll uh, uh, take a vote. Uh, Stu? Yes. Tina? Yes. Uh, I don't believe Glenn is on the call still. Uh, um, Virginia? Yes. Mo? Yes. Adam? Yes. David. Yes. Rick. Yes. Mike. Yes. Bob. Yes. Anne Marie. Yes. Um, and uh, I think that's everybody. Um, and I as chair, uh, M and I as well. The motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for attending. I'm grateful for you taking the time and uh, stay alert for the next meeting and look forward to it again. Thanks very kindly, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Stay, Thank safe you. And stay safe. Stay safe and happy holidays. Yes. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.